Traffic light colors, red, amber, and green, are used to indicate food's nutritional values according to the healthy standard. Different colors represent different food types, so that people can determine what to eat when they need some certain types of nutrient. The responsibility to label food properly on the packages is on the retailers. Thus, consumers can be aware of food with less salt or less fat. This system makes it easier for consumer to make decisions. In short, the more green on the label, the healthier the choice. If you buy a food that has all or mostly green on the label, you know straight away that it's a healthier choice. Amber means neither high nor low, so you can eat foods with all or mostly amber on the label most of the time. But any red on the label means the food is high in fat, saturated fat, salt or sugars, and these are the foods we should cut down on. Aquaculture, the farming of fish, shrimp, shellfish and seaweeds, has been the sources of human protein for nearly 4,000 years, especially in Asia. In the last decade however, there has been unprecedented growth in aquaculture production, more than 300% since 1984, which has increased the importance of the modern food supply. It's the world's fastest growing food production activity. And globally, more than 25% of the odd fishing and shellfish production in 1999 was attributable to aquaculture. Yes, this industry's contributions to human diet is actually greater than the numbers imply, whereas one-third of the conventional fish catch is used to make fish meal and fish oil. Virtually all farmed fish are used as human food. Today, nearly one-third of fish consumed by human is the product of aquaculture, and that percentage will only increase as aquaculture expands the world's conventional fish catch for the oceans and lakes continues to decline because of overfishing and environmental damage. I think with our linguistic training we also get all this invisible training to be authorities, to be the people who know. It is part of that process that you come out as a world authority on your chosen subject. But when we move into working with communities, we have to recognize that the communities have to be the authority in their language. Actually, a woman in the class I'm teaching at Sydney at the moment, a career woman, expressed this very nicely, although she was talking about something else, she was distinguishing expertise from authority. 
and certainly linguists, because of our training we do, have expertise in certain very narrow areas of language, but we don't have the authority over what to do with that knowledge or what to do with other knowledge that the community produces. I guess for me the bottom line is languages are lost because of the dominance of one people over another. That's not rocket science, it's not hard to work that out. But then what that means is if in working with language revival we continue to hold the authority, we actually haven't done anything towards undoing how languages are lost in the first place, so in a sense the languages are still lost if the authority is still lost. Our civilization, which subsumes most of its predecessors, is a great ship steaming its speed into the future. It travels faster, further, and more laden than any before. We may not be able to foresee every reef and hazard, but by reading her compass bearing and headway, by understanding her design, her safety record, and the abilities of her crew, we can, I think, plot a wise course between the narrows and bergs looming ahead. And I believe we must do this without delay, because there are too many shipwrecks behind us. The vessel we are now aboard is not merely the biggest of all time, it is also the only one left. The future of everything we have accomplished since our intelligence evolved will depend on the wisdom of our actions over the next few years. Like all creatures, humans have made their way in the world so far by trial and error, unlike other creatures, we have a presence so colossal that error is a luxury we can no longer afford. The world has grown too small to forgive us any big mistakes. The shuttle was designed to be a space truck, it's a multi-purpose vehicle. We've done a tremendous number of different things with it. It's the most versatile space vehicle that has ever been built. We've used it to launch satellites. We've used it to repair satellites in orbit and put them back into orbit. We've used it to capture satellites and bring them back to Earth for repair. We've outfitted it with the space lab built by our European partners and used it before the era of the space station to do scientific research. We used it as part of our partnership with the Russians, which is still continuing, first as part of the Mir space station, where we actually prolonged the useful life of Mir by several years through logistical supply visits with the shuttle. And now, of course, we're using it to build the new International Space Station, which is a huge international partnership.
protons are finally transferred to the LHC, both in a clockwise and an anti-clockwise direction, where they are accelerated for 20 minutes to 6.5 TeV. Beams circulate for many hours inside the LHC beam pipes under normal operating conditions. For each collision, the physicist's goal is to count, track and characterize all the different particles. The charge of the particle, for instance, is obvious since particles with positive electric charge bend one way, and those with negative charge bend the opposite way. Also the momentum off the particle can be determined. Large Hadron Collider, LHC, is the world's largest particle accelerator lies in a tunnel. The LHC is a ring roughly 28 kilometers around that accelerates protons almost to the speed of light before colliding them head-on. Protons are particles found in the atomic nucleus, roughly 1,000 million millionth of a meter in size. The LHC starts with a bottle of hydrogen gas, which is sent through an electric field to strip away the electrons, leaving just the protons electric and magnetic fields are the key to a particle accelerator. So that creates tensions, and that's what I want to talk about. Because I think it's important that we are, as a society, able to have an informed debate about how much privacy is enough, but not too much, how much security is enough, but not too much. Privacy, as a human right, that's simply quoting the Universal Declaration. In the physical world, we've got all kinds of protections. There is evidence that we care about our privacy. We've got locks, we've got obscured glass, we've got lots, we wear clothes, we put up shutters. And technology continues to erode the privacy that exists in the real world, in the three spatial dimensions. Security cameras, automatic number, plate recognition take away anonymity. Long lenses, paparazzi, take away distance and the privacy that used to create. And body scanners are increasingly being used to see through for example. This process isn't going to slow down and the new quantum technologies are actually being able to do gravitational sensing. And that's advancing at a remarkable rate. And you can't shield gravity. So some of the new quantum technologies are able already to see through walls. And there are technologies also for seeing round corners now using scattered light from lasers. Technology continues to erode privacy.
Turner, not surprisingly, painted one of the earliest pictures of London's fog, in the 1835 painting The Thames above Waterloo Bridge. Turner is a true-born Londoner, is advertising his familiarity with London's air problem by putting smoke and atmospheric pollution at its center. And as you can see in here, the bridge is the central elements, which is a theme that's later taken up by Monet. And it's partly obscured by the steam and smoke which rises from both sides of the river. Here, we see a shot tower. I think you can just about to see, which was constructed in 1826. Do you know what shot towers are? They produce shot for guns, ammunition. And they were very smoky, one of the more smoking industries. But it's barely visible, as you can see, as are the various industries on the Lambeth side of the river. There's, on this side, there's a steamship about to dock or preparing to leave. It's black smoke thrusting up to join the kind of swirling arc of smoke there. William Rodner sees this painting as a potent essay on the energy and complexity of modern polluted organism. Smoke, I think, here represents for a flourishing economy, which brings employment and food on tables, but also the dirt and pollution associated with the fumes all seems to be tainted by sulfurous yellow. Climate change, some adverse effects of climate changes to agricultural productions. Some lands are unsuitable for growing crops. There will be millions of people facing hunger in Africa in the future. Climate change will result in less production and less food. It is difficult for developing countries to deal with climate change due to their financial status and other issues. There are many people living in hunger especially in Africa. The climate change has devastating effects on world economy. The tropical areas on Earth are dry and hot, and are originally not suitable for food production. The change of the climate leads to extreme weather conditions such as flood and hurricane, which exacerbates the food production. As a result, it leads to a continuous decline in food supply annually around 10 to 17 percent. And this trend is perceived to be continue in the future by 2070. The regions suffering the most will be some African countries. Welsh is a Celtic language spoken in Wales by about 740,000 people, and in the Welsh colony in Patagonia, 
Argentina by several hundred people. There are also Welsh speakers in England, Scotland, Canada, the USA, Australia and New Zealand. At the beginning of the 20th century about half of the population of Wales spoke Welsh as an everyday language. Towards the end of the century, the proportion of Welsh speakers had fallen to about 20%. According to the 2001 census 582,368 people can speak Welsh, 659,301 people can either speak, read or write Welsh, and 797,717 people, 28% of the population, claim to have some knowledge of the language. According to a survey carried out by S4C, the Welsh language TV channel, the number of Welsh speakers in Wales is around 750,000 and about 1.5 million people can understand Welsh. In addition there are an estimated 133,000 Welsh speakers living in England, about 50,000 of them in the Greater London area. Welcome to today's lesson. We're continuing with our study of taxonomy. Taxonomy is how scientists classify organisms into different groups based on the characteristics that they share. So, for instance, a good way to think about taxonomy is the U.S. Postal Service. If we want to send a letter to someone, we first start off by addressing it to the nation they are in. By default, we usually assume that's America, but it doesn't have to be in England or Costa Rica or Spain. You put their nation or their kingdom. Then within that kingdom, you address it to a slightly more specific level their states. So, for instance, South Carolina would be the same as a phylum. And within that state, you would address it to their city, and then to their street number, the street they live on. Then you would address it to say their apartment complex, and within that complex, you'd address it by their last name to their family and then finally their first name to the specific person you want to get it to and in that way we're able to weed out all the 400 million people we don't want to send our letter to in America and pinpoint the exact person we want the letter to reach. And in the same way, scientists use a taxonomy chart to pinpoint a living creature and organism and how it relates to everything else in the world. We can ask two fundamental questions about animal behavior they referred to as proximate and ultimate. 
Proximate questions are those concerned with the mechanisms that bring about behavior. Ultimate questions are those concerned with the evolution of behavior. We can divide the proximate and ultimate into two sub-questions. For proximate, how does behavior develop and secondly what causes the behavior? For ultimate, you can ask how did the behavior evolve and secondly what is the adaptive of significance of the behavior? What's its purpose? Together these comprise what are called Tinbergen's four questions about animal behavior. Nico Tinbergen was one of the founding fathers of the study of the animal behaviors. These questions represent different ways of studying animal behavior, and understanding the difference between those four questions are fundamental to understanding behavior, and indeed the whole of biology. How do we study animal behavior? Well that depends on the type of question we're hoping to answer. According to the World Health Organization, 400 million people worldwide have no access to essential health care. That's a staggering number of people. Some of those services include things like basic sanitation and clean water, prenatal care, and vaccinations or immunizations for children. Many things contribute to this crisis. Sometimes people live to remotely to get timely care if emergency occurs. Even when living in a city, the patient-to-doctor ratio can be as high as 50,000 people to just one doctor, making it impossible for the doctor to meet the demands of health care in that area. These are valuable people made in the image of God who are physically suffering. Many of them go without a personal relationship with Christ. So we do this with a week of hands-on training, consisting of a variety of topics like basic sanitation and hygiene, taking vital signs, wound care and infection prevention, basic birth assisting, and emergency skills. Those who participate in the training then have practical skills and supplies to care for others in their community in a way that glorifies God and opens the door for sharing the gospel in a new way. Today we're going to recount heroic tales of superhuman feats of strength, when in the face of disaster, some people are said to have summoned up incredible physical power to lift a car off of an accident victim, move giant rocks, or like Big John of Song, single-handedly hold up a collapsing beam to let the other miners escape. Are such stories true? There are many anecdotes supporting the idea, 
but we're going to take a fact-based look at whether or not it truly is possible for an adrenaline-charged person to temporarily gain massive strength. In proper terminology, such a temporary boost of physical power would be called hysterical strength. The stories are almost always in the form of one person lifting a car off of another. In each of these cases, some aspect of leverage or buoyancy probably played some role in reducing the magnitude of the feat to something more believable. And even lifting many cars by several inches still leaves most of its weight supported by the suspension springs. But our purpose today is not to debunk any of the specific stories. The majority of them are anecdotal, and interestingly not repeatable, in many cases, the person who summoned the super strength later tried it again only to find that they couldn't do it. Basically, what we have is a respectably large body of anecdotal evidence that suggests that in times of crisis, danger, or fear, some people have the ability to temporarily exercise superhuman strength. Well, if there are no more questions, I would like to continue our discussion of human evolution by looking at Homo erectus, the earliest of our ancestors who stood upright. Homo erectus lived about one and a half million years ago, and was given that name because, at the time the first fossil was discovered, it represented the first primate to stand upright. There is evidence now that Homo erectus had sharper mental skills than their predecessors. They constructed the first standardized tool for hunting and butchering. They created an extraordinary stone implement, a large teardrop-shaped hand axe whose design and symmetry reveal a keen sense of aesthetics. This detailing, along with the axe's utilitarian value, strongly suggests that Homo erectus had the ability to conceive of and execute a design to specification. In addition, Homo erectus was the first hominid to use fire. This discovery enticed them to cook meat which they could flavor and keep from spilling by flame and which paleontologists now believe may have given them a new disease. Some fossil bones of Homo erectus are grossly deformed and paleontologists have noted that this condition is similar to that found in people today who have been exposed to chronic overdoses of vitamin A. Apparently Homo erectus first got this disease by eating large amounts of animal liver.